Well, hello and welcome. You know, Napoleon, the, the number five lesson in Napoleon Hill's 17 principles of personal achievement is pleasing personality. Personality is the sum total of one's mental, spiritual, and physical traits and habits that distinguish one from all others. It is the factor that determines whether one is liked or disliked by others. Talk Leadership with Cedric starts now. Well, hello and welcome to Talk Leadership with Cedric. You know, everybody needs a little TLC. Talk Leadership with Cedric is where we focus on leadership and personal growth with business leaders, educators, and local thought leaders. Our goal is to introduce our audience to leaders who are making an impact with innovative ideas. See, our guiding leadership principle is the law of contribution, which says growing yourself enables you to grow others. See, you can't give what you don't have. So first, you must grow yourself in order to grow others. We believe that outstanding leaders like yourself will help us help others. So tonight, we have another dynamic leader with us. And I'm so excited to introduce you uh, to the leader that we have with us. And uh, you know, you know, every week I like to do a proper introduction of our guest. So let me do a proper introduction of our guest. Tonight we have Miss Joy Appenzeller Bauer. Now, Joy is a tenured marketing executive who has successfully balanced a career in marketing while pursuing her passion, fine art, most of her journey. She has extensive experience in business development, market segmentation, sales enablement, marketing automation, content management, data analysis, market intelligence, branding, and program management. Joy has launched numerous healthcare and safety products and services with quantifiable lead generation and direct e-commerce revenue. She currently works full-time as a director of global strategic marketing, applying these skills to uh, for uh, underwriters laboratories, the company which issues over 22 billion UL marks on consumer and industrial products uh, per year, and is trusted by the public and integrators to signal safety conformance. She is also the owner of Art de Joy, retailing French realism, original oil painting, um, Zeekly prints, and greeting cards. Joy believes holistic fulfillment is essential to long-term career satisfaction, financial impact, first-to-market innovation, conquering challenges, and inspiring others. See, loyalty and, and integrity to both the company mission and Admiral, um, uh, Admiral Direct Manager has been uh, constant anchors as she climbed the corporate ladder from companies like... Um, uh, Yaskawa Electric, Abbott Laboratories, Go Abbott, uh, Danaher, <laughs> and UL. Joy UL. is active. <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, UL. Joy yeah, everybody recognizes the UL, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> In various company and volunteer community women's leadership organizations, she is a champion of personal reinvention with respect to contemporary skill development, aligning current market demand with one's unique talents and specific software proficiency, data science, and multi-generational leadership. Let's welcome Ms. Joy Appenzeller Bauer to the show. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you for tell everybody about how uh, we go way back and how yeah. we're friends. That this is not just purely a business. Interview. Absolutely, we go way back. Um, yeah, we're gonna have a good. In fact, for your viewers, look. Oh back, my um, God. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are funny. <laughs> that was like 2003, 2004. <laughs> wow. Amazing. That was, let me see, 2003 or 2004 when that was. Something like that. <laughs> wow. 
I had a few of your other listeners at that same party, I think. Gresh, you had him on recently, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, anyway. Wow, that's amazing. That was, a, was that the party at your place? I think we added several, but uh, there was one where I decided to take a lot of pictures of people, and I was going through the photo album the other day, and I'm like, <laughs> Cedric, not the <laughs> That is amazing. <laughs> I was young and thin then. <laughs> okay, so this show is about joy, not Cedric. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Joy, thanks for coming on the show. I'm, I'm totally excited that you're here. Um, so, you know, I read your your, um, your your bio, but, you know, our audience really likes to hear directly from you. It's like bringing your bio to life. So to give the listeners um, a little snippet of your, your journey to leadership and, and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have a rather unconventional uh, career path, probably for most of the folks on the phone tuning in. That I started off as an artist, as um, you guys could hear that I have an art business and I've kept that. Uh, through the last 10 or so years. Um, so I started off, I have a BFA actually, a Bachelor of Fine Art from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I had dreams at the time of becoming a painter, a fine artist, gallery person, all of that. And then I realized, you know, that's a bit of a risky value proposition when it comes to making your own money and sustaining yourself as a person in your early 20s, whatever. So I went towards graphic design and they called that visual communication at the time. Uh, became uh, kind of rose up as a designer and creative director and so forth. And then I transitioned into more technical marketing roles. Uh, specifically, this was in the 90s. And uh, I learned how to code. And that became uh, quite uh, profitable for me. And that, that was a time when no one really, you probably remember Razorfish and some of those early uh, agencies that were helping everybody and their brother develop a website. There just weren't that many people that knew HTML, JavaScript. Lotus script for the for the people that are technical listening uh, from the mm -hmm. back machine with uh, Lotus Notes. Um, so we used to code and all of those things. So I, I went in technical direction and then I ended up moving into a more of a business development strategic uh, role. And that's really where my interest was is to develop my critical thinking skills and, and figure out how to make money whether it required technical uh, web-based marketing, offline marketing, and now I'm half of my day job is um, figuring out which services for UL are going to serve the market, responding to different conditions like COVID this year for sure. And then, um, you know, what are some other things that will complement our long range plan or will become just more attractive in general uh, for the company's portfolio? Okay. Wow. Um, well, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, and I, I want to talk with you a little bit about how you managed career along with mm -hmm. your uh, love for, for uh, fine art. But before we yeah. get there, you know, you've had a long uh, corporate career mm -hmm. uh, with several different uh, um, uh, high profile companies. Uh, so help our audience understand how flexible you had to be over the years to uh, manage those um, those careers in, in large companies like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of women will appreciate this, especially that I haven't had the best luck with my love life sometimes. So I've suddenly had to, I found myself um, divorced and having to stand on my own two feet and, and clean up some financial troubles on a personal level. And so I've had to be someone that really, um, is constantly developing my skills and skills that companies demand. What's hot? What's current? So in the mid '90s, it was HTML, right? That every you you know our clients. If I was working at an uh, advertising agency, they didn't want brochures anymore. They wanted websites. Right. Now companies want really sophisticated, advanced digital marketing strategies, and you've got to kind of move with the cheese. You know, one of the gals on my staff this year, I'm really proud of her. Landria is her name, and she was a, uh, uh, she still is actually an, a trade show specialist. But thanks to COVID, we're not doing as many events. 
and she was able to, she had some extra capacity and I just kind of encouraged her, hey, what do you think about applying those same project management skills to developing our company intranet site that had kind of been neglected, was a bit of a patchwork quilt. And she was able to pull that off and did a wonderful job sitting down with a number of stakeholders, working with IT and pulling together a really nice solution for our sales reps and other employees globally. So that's the kind of mindset you want to have is, is just always re think about reinventing yourself. Who you were yesterday does not define who you're going to be tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's definitely uh, key and, and, and critical uh, and important. And one of the things that you said was, um, uh, uh, hey, you found yourself um, uh, divorced and then having to reinvent yourself. And a lot of people, when they go through, whether it's divorce or some other traumatic thing, they shut down yeah, and their career could suffer. Uh, from that and then they never pulled themselves back through that mm -hmm. um, so uh, how did you develop that resiliency to to bounce back and and reinvent yourself like that yeah you just sometimes you're dealt a bad hand you know but it's not your fault you got those cards um it's how you play the game right and how you say you know what i'm going to trade in this card for something else and i'm not just going to be stuck with this hand i'm going to i'm going to do something else here so you just have to kind of realize that it's your own inner engine um our ceo likes to say take the job that nobody else wants jenny scanlon she's our new ceo of ul as of last year i would say something slightly different i would say take the job nobody else is doing hmm. Well, that means think about the gap and that, you know, maybe um, you can think about this is what I'm hearing in the marketplace. This is what I'm hearing customers want. Go be that person who fills that demand. And yeah. then figure reverse engineer, right? Like, OK, this is the need. How, how can I help that person or that persona? So that's really served me well in order. You know, I've taken. Um, Throughout my career journey, I worked for all those big companies, but in my late, let's see. So what happened, I'll just be straight up. I worked for Abbott with you and GE bought Abbott and that was gonna be great. We were all going to move to Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. I was on the transition team, all of these things. And that acquisition ended up falling through. And subsequently at the time, ironically, I was considered senior management <laughs> and 50 of us all got laid off just like that all in the same day we were kind of like oh my gosh you know i had like presidents of lords and all this stuff and i thought how in the heck did that just happen <laughs> and, and so you know it, it, the shock of it wore off after a while but i'm like you know this is maybe a time to, to think about going back to those art skills that i had neglected and rather than sitting at home watching soap operas and feeling sorry for myself what can i do to make being laid off never ever happen again and part of entrepreneurship involves all right you're having to do all the things inventory management accounting sales marketing everything but you're also the ceo of your own company mm -hmm. and no one can really you know lay you off or ha impact your livelihood it's your own engine so doing in that period of time i spent six years on and off, um, and actually Abbott did rehire me <laughs> to do some consulting work for them, so we're all good. Um, but um, what I was able to do is develop my own business, Art de Joie, um, and uh, the first thing I did was develop, a, uh, find which website was available, and that was instead of Art of Joy, I went with the French version, Art de Joie, because oh, yeah. in in the uh, early 2000s, that domain was available. And I would tell any entrepreneur, that's one of the first things you need to consider because that's going to then help you form a brand strategy. So what I was able to do is build up an inventory of paintings that then um, turned into Gicle prints, into greeting cards. I did show in a number of galleries, Chicago art festivals and so forth. And I married, I remarried was able to, um, my husband was able to provide, you know, as far as like the benefits and all that kind of stuff. And so I could really pursue my passion for a while, but then, um, you know, things changed and I had to go back into the corporate environment, but I felt like those were still transferable skills and provided a really fresh, diverse perspective for a big corporation to be able to have that, um, you know, inventive mindset 
and also a consumer lens for a B2B company. So I think that actually worked out really nicely. Yeah, wow, that's um, th that's awesome. And it's, it's glad, I'm glad that you had that foresight um, to make that switch and make that change and, and transform yourself. Um, a lot of people don't have that, that ability to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is about your uh, love for French fine art. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, how did that develop? How did you get interested in that? Yeah, so when I was at the Art Institute, I actually went to Miami, Ohio first, as my mom was uh, convinced I was going to end up on drugs or have a bad lifestyle if I went to a major urban art school. <laughs> and she wore me down. You know, I, I, I went to visit RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, Maryland, and Baltimore and everything. And I thought that was great, but my mom didn't really see it that way. <laughs> And she kept wearing me down to go to some nice girls college. So I went to Miami of Ohio, ended up making a ton of friends, was in a sorority, the whole works. But then um, the teachers were kind of like, uh, you have this serious art talent. <laughs> you need to really nurture this. So that's when I transferred back um, to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is one of the country's elite top three or so art schools, and then took that talent seriously. Um, I was in studio painting at the same time as visual communication, and I was just really drawn to John Singer Sargent. I was a famous portrait painter who is an American who studied in France, and I just loved the silken quality of the oil paints, really old school, but just gorgeous. And so now I paint actually on plein air, uh, which means paint outside. It's a uh, very traditional technique. It doesn't use any photography or any artificial anything. It's just being out there in nature, like Monet's haystacks kind of thing. And I just find that to be so relaxing and peaceful, especially when you're spending so much time on the computer, like even we are now, you right. know, for your eyes, right? So, right. <laughs> so it's so nice to have that outlet. And so I just do it kind of on the side. I only maybe turn out 10, 15 paintings a year now because I am working full time again. So the art thing's, you know, taking a bit of a back seat, but it still provides that fulfillment and that relief of managing, you know, a big global team and all these things. Wow. Well, that is, uh, that, that's awesome. That's outstanding. So uh, we, we have on, on the, um, on the screen, um, the oh, uh, place where your marketplace where people can purchase your uh, your painting. So tell us a little bit about w what they would what they will find when they go to your um, online marketplace. Yeah, well, I have the website artdeschwad.com. Uh, just my store hasn't been updated as as rapidly as I should have done <laughs> this year. I've been so busy <laughs> with my day job that uh, probably my Etsy store is a little more current. Uh, Etsy is what we would call a marketplace, which is correct, that brings uh, together a number of different sellers. Uh, so on Etsy, you can see a, a current inventory of originals that everything listed there is still available. And then the uh, prints are very popular as well as the greeting cards. Uh, a lot of Chicago, um, probably the most prolific Chicago realism painting uh, painter. I think I have one, let's see, the other way behind me, you can see my easel. Yeah. It's seen in progress, um, but I'm kind of well known for that. I had stuff featured on The Good Wife on TV and also um, have a New York collection that I uh, featured at the American Express building one year on Wall Street. So that was pretty cool. Um, so it's just some years, you know, art's a bigger part of my life than others right now. It's a bit of a backseat. So I haven't created a ton of new work as compared to other years, but my greatest hits, if you will, uh, a lot of them have archival um, quality prints available. Wow. Well, that's awesome. Well, the link is right there on the screen. It's also in the comments if you just want to be able to copy and paste. Um, the link is in the uh, comments and you can do that. Definitely go and support um, uh, Joy in, in her work, in, in, in her art. And, you know, Christmas is coming up. You might have something you want to give someone something for Thanksgiving. It's been a long, arduous year and you just want to thank someone. Right. So uh, go to her store and um, and 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 support her. Um, so, um, you know, this this year, like I said, has been long and different it's been like no other year. Um, yeah. So uh, what has your team uh, done to adjust um, uh, in this time of COVID um, lockdown? 
Yeah, well, it, we first got the notification we were locking down mid-March. I think most companies, that was about the time frame. We're based out of Chicago in Northbrook, Illinois. Uh, however, we have offices around the world, about 15,000 employees. I manage a uh, matrix of about 20 of them, and some of them are located in India, in China, Japan, Germany, Austin, Texas. So they're with you in Texas. We have big hub. Uh, Washington, D.C., et cetera. So we were used to working on conference calls anyway. That wasn't such a big shift, but we ended up working longer hours at first because being in healthcare, we are directly part of the uh, pandemic solution. So what UL does is we um, set uh, regulatory, we work with regulatories on uh, defining what's considered safe and effective as far as electrical safety, toxicity, cybersecurity, uh, a number of conditions um, that's on the UL side. And then we also have a consulting business uh, that helps companies get on market a little bit quicker and interpret the regulations and that sort of thing. So because um, the emergency use authorization came out um, per the FDA uh, to help with the supply chain of um, PPE and ventilators and critically needed goods, uh, we had to really help a lot of different manufacturers figure out how to reformulate their recipe, if you will, to be able to take even like an automotive um, factory and retool it in order to make some of these goods. Because it was like everybody pitching in, right, that it was the thing to do. And so we were ending up working at first kind of, you know, really, really killer hours in the second quarter. So that was an adjustment. But, you know, it, the time goes quickly when you're doing the right thing in a public good and, and really focused on that mission. So people didn't mind. And then what we started to do is, um, you know, as things stabilized a little bit in the summer, and then we started to have, you know, a little more happy hours and flexibility, let people go right. for long walks during the day and just kind of, you know, make the best of it. But I think I've been in the office only twice in this fall. Uh, so there's not really a need for us, um, you know, marketing and sales people so much, um, commercial folks to be in the office. It's mostly for we want to protect the health and safety of our engineers who are the guys in the lab that are pressure testing widgets and that kind of thing. So for their safety, it's really best that we try to limit, you know, who's all in the building any given time. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, this is help companies realize that they could be. Well, let me say it this way. You know, smaller companies are more normal, normally more nimble and and flexible and easily to to move. Right. Mm -hmm. Larger companies like those big ships that take a long time to change. Well, COVID came and wiped all of that out. Right. Yeah. So now it's going to make these larger companies realize that they can be nimble and quick when they need to be. For right. sure. Like I'll give you an example of something we're working on right now. So in business development, I'm constantly aware of what's happening out there that how do we create more value, right? And how do we, because our mission, um, you know, really has to do with enabling on the healthcare side, I lead the healthcare practice in terms of marketing, um, that how do we help um, get patient outcomes, really? How do we help the general public uh, get access to innovation and safe innovation. And right now, as everyone's familiar in the news, there are two major vaccines, hopefully, that are um, going to be good to go, that are deemed uh, clinically effective from Pfizer as well as from Moderna. Um, so what we'd like to do is to help with the supply chain as those um, vaccines are going to need to be very carefully transported, stored, and then distributed. So we're working right now on some solutions uh, to help um, with the temperature control and, and different logistical concerns. So uh, you do even in this, um, you know, especially um, during the pandemic, but you always want to have that flexible mindset, not just for yourself, but for your company, uh, constantly stay relevant and connected to your customers. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I know that there are a couple of my friends that are that are watching. Show yeah. me that picture again, uh, Joe. Oh, boy. <laughs> One day I was, you know, I was this mean, <laughs> lean, slick guy, you know. I was mean, <laughs> mean. Ooh, look at my hair. <laughs> I have a lot of others. So <laughs> That is funny. <laughs> uh, that, that one seemed like it was all right to share. Yeah, that was. <laughs> 
Oh. But you know, you got to make friends at work. That you know, when you're in a high stress role and you're doing all these things, that, that you know, that the friends you make sometimes they last. Look at us, almost twenty years. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, leaders' joy come in all different types of packages with different strengths, right? Yeah. So, what are what what are what strengths do you feel are important for successful mm -hmm. leaders to have? Yeah, well, I would say probably the abil ability to articulate a vision because people want to know where they're going, where they're headed, and then uh, develop a couple of KPIs. You know, a previous guest you had, Joe Nemers, uh, this guy I always really admired. He was uh, president at Abbott for a while there, and he was really good about establishing five and no more than five president's imperatives, uh, strategic imperatives every year. And then everything we did laddered up to one of those. So if somebody asked you to do something that seemed kind of wonky or was a one-off, you could just say, yo, was that on Joe's list? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think, you know, that was, uh, that's something I carry to this day and I encourage other leaders at UL and other places to do the same thing, to be really consistent about your priorities. That right. employees generally do not like waffling. They don't like the fire drill of the day, the fire drill of the week. It makes them feel like you don't have a handle. <laughs> right. And where you're steering the ship. Right. I would say that's pretty important. Um, I think you also want to, um, you know, uh, stand up for the team, you know, really understand where they're coming from, um, clarify what their specific role and how they can contribute, and then, you know, be flexible because not everybody is motivated the same way. So that book, uh, Situational Leadership, I think that was actually one Abbott used to use for uh, new managers at the time. I think that was a pretty good book. Yes. And in fact, if I could turn my computer and show you my wall here, oh. I still have my situational leadership uh -huh. model that we used yeah. uh, here in front of me because I would use it when I was on my one-on-one -on -one calls with my reps sometimes. Sometimes they think, well, Cedric, uh, you need to switch up the situation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, you I'm know, the best one. <laughs> it's like, hey, look, uh, are you hitting a number or not? <laughs> <laughs> the situation is I need this number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <All right. laughs> but, uh, yes, no, you're absolutely right. I love the Ken Blanchard's uh, situational leadership model. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one that Amber mentioned last week, this uh, Clifton Strengths Finder. Uh -huh. This is a sensation this year for UL uh, that a lot of us were reading. This. this is a good one, too, because this helps you because a lot of a lot of people tend to focus on their weaknesses and oh, I should be doing this better. I should be more like Cedric. I should be more like, <laughs> I should be more like whoever. And, and then you feel bad after a while. because you're like, man, I'm never going to be that great. at. It. I'm never going to be as good at, as Cedric at uh, relating to people, you know, but you know, maybe that's not really my strong suit, but that's okay because there's 35 <laughs> possible strengths. So yeah. figure out which five are your top, and then really refine those strengths and make the most of those in your, uh, in your, um, you know, day to day. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So one of my friends and I put his comment up on the screen here, he says, uh, Cedric's photo was photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. I got more, but I don't know. that. Those are both into the camera show, so. <laughs> um, no, um, yeah, Derek, that was me. I was real thin back then. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I like the um, last name though. That's that's my kind of guy. Shannon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you know, uh, good leaders ask great questions, right? Mm -hmm. So, Joy, what have been some questions that great questions that that either you have asked or mm -hmm. someone have a has asked of you, and you went, "Wow, that's a really good question." Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, personal growth, um, I'm not the best at this, quite honestly, that I feel like I need to ask for feedback more often. Um, but as a strategic leader, uh, something that I ask in group meetings all the time as serves me well is, you know, we're in a for profit entity, at least in my space, uh, that how is this going to make money or how is this going to make us uh, more efficient, more profitable? And again, if I get kind of a loosey answer, then, you know, I don't know, we're going to have to spend a little more time here to entertain this idea. Uh, so it helps people just think about, you know, that end result. 
Um, the other thing I like to do is, and maybe because I'm an artist and pe sometimes people, eh, not as much, I mean, you can only get away with this for so long and then people are onto it. <laughs> but you can just say, well, I'm new or, oh, I'm well this or, or something. And this may be a stupid question, but. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> the elephant in the room question that you, <laughs> turns out. People are too proud to ask. Exactly. But my goal as the, the head of marketing, like I really need to understand this stuff because I may be talking to a media reporter. I may be packaging it up an all employee message that I need to really know what I'm talking about. And so I need to have the confidence to, to say, you know, I don't understand. Help me out with this. Yes. Because you establish credibility, right? And, mm -hmm. and and you learn that, you know what, I may sound kind of a little dim for five minutes, but I'm going to turn right around and ask a zinger question in 15 minutes once I fully can connect the dots. And sure. that's just how it is. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with that. Uh, that's awesome. So how do you balance then career and all those other interests? Mm, yeah. So some weeks you have more work-life balance than others. That's just kind of how it is. Like right now I'm working on that cold chain solution that probably it's not going to be the greatest this week. But then, you know, have that flexibility that, all right, when when things have slowed down a little bit, maybe during the holidays or whatever, then take a little more time. Um, so what I try to do is, you know, again, that outdoor painting when I can, I find that to be incredibly relaxing. If not, I'll work in my studio and paint. Um, Kind of exercise a little bit more. I love cooking. So I try to do things that have nothing to do with the computer because I spend so much, you know, my whole day can be right. 11 a.m. I've got calls um, with Europe, or whatever. And then I've got evening calls with India. So you've got to carve out time in the middle for yourself, just uh, if nothing else, for your mental health and your eyes. Yes. Um, yeah, it's um, it's always good to just turn it off and, and get away. Mm -hmm. um, and um, otherwise, work can consume you and yeah. you have a balance on the other side where you're spending more time doing your fun stuff versus work, then that's not going to be a good thing either, right? Right. Hey, one, uh, Derek uh, uh, Champagne says, uh, Dwight White Jr. is mm -hmm. a new aspiring artist that um, she might want to look at uh, in Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So um, wh what are two or three things that individuals can do to help themselves to get into your industry? Uh, uh, do you mean marketing or do you mean healthcare? Well, um, marketing in healthcare, because, you know, here's what happens a lot of times. So, um, Marketing um, uh, is is hard for a new like a new college grad to get into. A lot of times we'll say, "Hey, go find a job in sales, uh, mm -hmm. and then come back and talk to us." Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. well, sales is definitely one entry pathway. I have a gal on my staff who handles sales enablement, and she formerly was in the field, so that's really great to have that voice of internal customer firsthand experience. So I like to hire people that came from sales. A um, couple areas that are hot uh, that'll fast track you in, uh, especially for an interview if you're um, you know, a college age type person or recently graduated, or even someone reinventing yourself, is analytics. Uh, statistics is becoming a, a huge part of marketing these days because um, it helps inform um, digital marketing decisions and what the optimal media mix should be for something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would encourage folks to take up an interest in analytics and statistics and that sort of thing. And it seems if you don't like math, it's not really the same thing as math math. It's not like physics. So I'll give it a try that um, it's kind of more like spatial relationship of numbers sometimes and looking at a slope and like a probability. It's um, it seems intimidating, but it's actually it's kind of cool. I think it's interesting. So I would encourage that for sure. Uh, look at job postings uh, for marketing positions and find out, you know, what are um, the specific flavors of marketing that are hot in your city or your area? and then get those skills. Um, in the way of technical, Google is pretty good about certifications these days, uh, that they offer a lot of online uh, training and certification. 
Um, so that's a nice resume filler too, especially if you're going in a new direction to show that you have acquired those technical skills. Uh, as far as healthcare goes, um, I would say um, maybe uh, land and expand. So take a functional job at a big healthcare company um, and then start to learn more about the science and about um, you know all the different uh, therapeutic areas, disease states, what have you, because uh, it takes a while. It, it you know it can take a few years just to get up to speed with the vocabulary and some of the acronyms and that. It's a it's a long learning curve, um, but it is super rewarding. I love being in healthcare because of that. Uh, satisfaction that you're helping patients, you know, get through something, spend less time on operating tables, spend less time dealing with a disease that's sidelining them. So it's a really fulfilling area yeah. um, and it's growing for sure. And there's just so much innovation happening with uh, health tech in particular, with the miniaturization and mobilization of medical devices with, uh, you know, everyone's familiar with a company like Fitbit, uh, but software as a medical device is is hot, and uh, that's a cool thing about our industry, right? Is that there's just tremendous innovation uh, pulling from Silicon Valley, from Sao Paulo, from uh, Japan, Seoul, all these uh, global communities of hotbeds of innovation on the IT side as well as chemical side coming together. So if you're a person that gets bored easily. Uh, healthcare can really be fulfilling in that way and, and very mission, of course, focused. So super recommend that. But you can't, if you're starting out fresh and you want to get in, you probably can't be overly picky and expect, you know, if you were a senior blah -de blah in whatever other industry that you're just going to waltz in because you're going to have to kind of pay your dues. Right. I love what you said, though, land and expand. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Uh, in that phrase like that before. So I wrote that down because that's actually really good to tell um, new graduates. And I talk to a lot of new graduates and a lot of yeah. new entrepreneurs sometimes. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that, Joy. I like that. I didn't invent it. That's something we say well, <laughs> to be fair. Well, I'm going with you've invented it. <laughs> yeah, this guy, Carlos, actually. But whatever. <laughs> He's not on the go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what role does networking play in, in navigating a corporate ladder? Yeah, that's that's pretty huge. I mean, hey, I'm on your show tonight because of networking, right? But, mm -hmm. um, you know, that you always want to, this is where integrity really comes in, I'd say, is that you want to be somebody that um, gets your positions based on merit and merit alone. You never want to be perceived as someone that kind of stepped on other people or took a shortcut or was shifty in any way because the people around you will remember that for years. So when you find yourself and you're needing to get a foot in the door somewhere or maybe, you know, you need a, a leg up, then, you know, having that Rolodex of people that know that you're a team player and that you're um, somebody that will be accountable really, really matters. So you, you, you want to protect your brand, right? That you don't right. want to be perceived as a ball dropper. You want to be the mailman. Right. You know what I mean by that? You want to be somebody that delivers. Who delivers, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody likes a mailman. <laughs> Everybody wants somebody like that on their team. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll put that on there. Be the mailman. <laughs> Don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. Be the mailman. <laughs> be the guy that everybody knows is is coming around and is going to get the project done. Is going to be somebody that helps other people achieve the, the group goal. Yes, absolutely <laughs> love that. Be the mailman. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, growth, you know, networking is one thing. That's one way to definitely help people understand who you are and get to know you and, and that type thing. But the other thing is you have to be intentional in order for growth to happen. Right. Um and it kind of goes on a lot in the lines of what you talked about the when you talk about the land and expand. The expand mm -hmm. is growing yourself, getting to understand who the market, uh, who the um, uh, more on the technical side, understanding the science behind the business, understanding maybe some technical job, understanding all the different facets of the organization, and going deep into um, what what the organization does. So maybe then you can then. Um, 
bring some of your talents to those areas. So um, what do you do for personal growth and our professional growth? Yeah. So as far as reading, I normally am spending a, a copious amount of time on a plane and in international airports, you know, a lot of, especially in Asia. So that's when I catch up on a lot of my personal growth reading. This year has been a little wonky in that, you know, I, we've been sidelined here, but um, I read a lot of these, the uh, Harvard Business Review, been around forever, but some yeah. good articles in here. Uh, so that's a good one. A book that uh, before we went live, I was going to tell you about was a digital vortex. That book looks at disruptive technologies. Okay. And, and uh, you know, like we were talking about the Netflix example, mm -hmm. it goes into that whole, you know, how to reinvent uh, before someone else does. Or sometimes what you want to do is protect something you have. Sometimes you want to recognize when it's time to abandon it and do something entirely different. Sometimes you want to collaborate, but at least to be aware of, you know, like a good old fashioned SWOT analysis that what are some of the things that uh, could upset the apple cart? Don't be stuck, you know, waiting for stuff, for things to happen, anticipate them. Um, so that, that book's really um, a great challenge and gets you thinking about uh, more strategically. Uh, so anybody in that kind of role or just that has a techie interest, I think that's a really great, that's one of the better business books I've read in a while. We have this program at UL um, called the Global Leader Program. They do a really nice job with, uh, it's called UL uh, University with executive training. We have a program with Yale and all of this stuff. And and so they give you, you know, how it goes, like 10 or 15 books you're supposed to read, you know, as a, as a student. And I really thought that was the best one last year of the curriculum. It was a really worthwhile read. It's it's a newer title. I think it's only two or three years old. And, and I think it really helps you stay relevant. So I, I like that. And then I do a lot of uh, webinars uh, too, especially from the FDA and other, you know, government entities, because that's a credible source that will review um, our own blogs and government. Um, we have a government affairs office look at what they have to say. And then I like interviewing people that sometimes reading is slow, right? right. But you get a lot more information conducting a good interview with, um, that's, that was that noise, was uh, one of our engineers beeping in, <laughs> like, hey, Joy, blah, 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 about that <laughs> cold chain. <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's cool that we had a really cool collaborative session earlier. Oh, jeez. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's really helpful, too, is that you don't have to know, you know, um, you know, it, it's time consuming to know a lot about any one subject. And if your role sometimes that, you know, certainly like sales, right, that you need to be aware of a lot of things that are out there um, so that then you can start to weave together a solution for your particular client. Or in my case, um, it may be, um, you know, uh, a, a full portfolio offering that will publish more broadly. Sure. Yeah. And and actually, so, you know, we're talking about it from a corporate perspective. However, this applies, the same thing applies to entrepreneurs. You know, what? when I talk to uh, new entrepreneurs, what I always tell them is, look, all the principles and the um, processes that I learned in big corporate in Abbott, mm -hmm. I apply those same things type principles and skills in my business. Global marketing, understanding the global marketplace, understanding um, in global, you know, global, we did all the strategic planning, understand I need to strategically plan for my business. Where do I want my business to be five years, 10 years from now? Right. Yeah. U.S. marketing was more tactical marketing. So where do mm -hmm. I want to see my business in the next year? What, what things should I be doing right now? Right. And then putting processes in place to make sure that you that you uh, that it's sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. Versus just living sort of like out of a suitcase, and you say, "Oh, I'm aware this today," and then the next day, well, "I'm aware this the next day," right? You, right? you have systems and processes that you what you're talking about is systems and processes that you're learning in corporate that entrepreneurs can apply in their business. For sure. Uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that about entrepreneurs and that we have a lot of sense of ownership too and seeing something all the way through. And then also reputation, customer service, as you know, probably with your business, uh, someone orders uh, maybe a book or, or a tape or whatever that you want to ship that out immediately. 
Right. And if for some reason there's going to be a delay, you know, you send the person a nice note, you follow up and, you know, just having that gratitude and appreciation for customers. I think that comes with being an entrepreneur and then having that mindset in a big company that helps set apart that company as being easier to do business with. I know it's big for a lot of companies. So how do they uh, because there are uh, sometimes so many departments and have some silos. How do they tie it all together for a great customer experience? So I think that's another huge asset to ha- spending any time as an entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneur or working in small business. Sure. Yes, absolutely. 100 percent agree with you. Um, so what advice would you give an emerging leader trying to find leadership opportunities or, or ways to fill their professional toolbox? Yeah. Yeah, well, one thing that um, is kind of cool is if your company offers diversity and inclusion groups, uh, that's a nice way to network with other people that might be outside of your immediate work group. And also, they're usually really happy to have volunteer program management if they're kicking off a new initiative um, to help with presentations. Uh, Your company may offer some sort of corporate citizenship, uh, volunteer work, like we work with Habitat for Humanity, for example. That's another great way to just, um, you know, because you're sitting there like nailing a roof or whatever, you know, you got like three or four hours sitting up there. You might be sitting next to some PP, you know, in R&D or some other area that you're not as familiar with, and you may as well shoot the breeze, you know. Right. <laughs> While you're out there being a do-gooder and, and you know doing something rewarding anyway, that it's just nice just to get to know people as people and hear more about you know how it is to be in their area. And then sometimes you find out, oh, I didn't realize that this uh, profession or this function involves this and this, and that's cool. And maybe these are things that eh, maybe I'm not so into that. So I think that's kind of cool uh, that you get to. It's kind of a twofer. You you get the networking and you feel like you did. Uh, something worthwhile for the day. So I think those are cool. Um, you know, be somebody that connects colleagues to other colleagues that I, I deal with this a lot in my current role is that, you know, find a person because UL is so big, it's 15,000 people. And then we have a parent company on top of that, and that uh, the not-for-profit developing standards and such that uh, it's nice just to be able to make, you know, if somebody's working in one area, but they don't maybe realize that, oh, this work may be related to something else, be that person that introduces that other colleague that you think can help them out. Um, I think that really helps you get in the game and, and be thought of. Um, and then take advantage of uh, company funded education that mm-hmm. I think a lot of people don't spend enough uh, effort investing in themselves because they're worried about the cost. Right. And, you know, you're way better at this than I am with the whole wealth management thing. <laughs> like that's not really my personal. <laughs> 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 We all have strengths, right? <laughs> but wouldn't you say, though, that, like, you know, don't let that stop you. It really makes me feel bad when folks feel like I didn't achieve as much as I could have because, oh, you know, I felt like I, this wasn't available to me. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, um, I always tell people, look, you, you, you especially if you're in large companies, they mm-hmm. offer so many services. Yeah, you just have to go out and ask, right? Your HR department um, will be able to tell you all the different services that they offer that could benefit you um, outside of just work. Because organizations understand that if they have a, a an employee that is well balanced, an employee that's not worried about you know where the next meal is coming from, an employee that has a healthy mind. When they come to work, they know that that employee is going to be a better contributor to the bottom line. They're going to be the mailman. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, read, look always at the job description of the job, the next job or two up mm-hmm. that you want and find out, well, what certifications are they listing? What uh, uh, degrees? What experience? And then, you know, reverse engineer it and then go get that, get those skills. Yes. Absolutely. And a lot of the company, you know, will help you out because it's a heck of a lot more expensive. One of my uh, good friends is in talent acquisition and she could tell you that, you know, it costs a ton for us to have to recruit on the outside. It's way better to develop our own talent. So, Absolutely. you know, companies usually are, are going to be, you know, recognize you as taking the initiative to raise your hand and say, hey, I, I, I realize I have a gap here in this skill set. Can you help me um, close that gap? 
Yes, absolutely. 100% agree with you. So, Joy, you know, we have a segment called Would You Rather? Oh, gee. Well, so, <laughs> it's very easy. It's, it, it's, well, a, it's a easy. Photo album. Oh, geez. So let, me, let me give you one. So, would you rather have more time or more money? Oh, gosh. Uh, probably more time because if you have more time, you can make more money, right? Sure. Yeah. Would you rather no one show up at your wedding or no one show up at your funeral? Uh, I, my funeral, because you're dead. Yeah. How are you going to know the difference? You're not going to know anyway, right? However, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> like <laughs> my sister. Would oh. you rather uh, be an adult your whole life or be a kid your whole life? An adult. I always felt like an old soul. Okay. All right. So would you rather have free Apple products forever or free Wi-Fi wherever you go? Hmm. Well, that's like not a fair question because <laughs> I actually get a corporate discount with both of them. <laughs> I don't know, it was, it's costing me more and uh internet and Wi-Fi services. So I, I, I go with that. With the Wi-Fi. All right. So last one. <laughs> so I got the rubber suit going. So I got too many, like, you got all the accessories. I learned the hard way. <laughs> yes. And the Apple loves you. That's, that's good. Uh -oh. So last one, would you rather have $1 million in Amazon gift cards or $100,000 in real money? Uh, the bigger number was in the gift cards. Yes. Yeah, the gift cards. The gift cards. Okay. Well, All right. The, I, the I, market I like value is higher, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you, you shop on most people shop on Amazon every day anyway, right? Yeah. So take the million dollars in Amazon gift cards, and you can buy. Heck, Amazon even sells houses now on little tiny houses. Yeah. On, yeah. on online now, so you can buy everything right on Amazon. There you go. Yeah, and you can always uh, resell in certain situations, or or construct and assemble and make something else. Exactly. You know do, right. Exactly, and then get the cash. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for playing that segment of. Rather. <laughs> Boy, was that the sanitized version? <laughs> hey, that was. <laughs> We have little children watching, so yeah, I want to show yeah. that, you know. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, Joy, you know, you've had a successful um, uh, corporate uh, career and a lot of success in the things that you're doing, but we've all also had failures, right? We've all had things that we didn't do as well as we thought. So tell us about one of your failures and a lesson that you learned from it. Yeah, well, um, maybe... Let's see, I bought a more recent one because um, I do like to debrief and discuss, you know, flops, and that's how you learn, right? Now you right. get better. So I actually have an executive coach um, besides regular mentors. So I am working with a guy who's been really helpful. His name's Alan. Hey, Alan, if you're listening. Uh, anyway, um, one of the things we discussed earlier this year um, is uh, I was in this meeting that uh, it felt like I kind of got ganged up on, that uh, people were asking questions about my methodology and what I was doing in my department. And they weren't like really having a ton. They didn't seem to really understand the background and the timing was bad because I was in the middle of some other emergency and really focused on that um, and that I perceived as more important overall. And then just really wasn't very prepared to, to have people coming at me asking zingers. And then I kind of got flustered, felt emotional, shut down, didn't uh, really answer any question all that well and just got defensive. And uh, I think what I could have done better was just to identify, oh, I'm feeling this way and slow my role, as, as Alan would say, that slowing down a conflict or something difficult is a really effective tactic, that when you feel yourself getting flustered, it's acceptable to ask for more time to reschedule a, a follow-up meeting when you can present the facts and data and that sort of thing, or maybe socialize whatever the topic with other people, or even if it's in the same meeting, just to not say anything immediately, 
just kind of pause and listen. Because another thing that sometimes happens is people will continue to work through something um, and figure out on their own that maybe they were going down a wrong path, that you don't have to be on the defense to, to say it. Sure. You know, yeah. so that, that's a real recent one. Um, just being real candid that, you know, uh, it may look like I have everything together. I don't, you know, I just stub my toes still <laughs> regularly and just hope that <laughs> people can see that I mean well and I try to, you know, take the feedback seriously and, and do better next time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we all have uh, growth opportunities. And so I said earlier, growth has to be intentional, right? So yeah. we all have those growth opportunities where um, we can get better uh, at, at different things, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, um, so if, and I normally use this as my 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 final question I want to ask you is, um, if there was a book <laughs> that was written about you, what would the title of the book be? And uh, on the back of the book, what would the summary say about you, Joy? Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> I think, well, I have to do something with my company name, right? So maybe something like The Art of the Restart. You know, okay. my company is Art of uh, Art de Joie. Art of Joy is the translation. So maybe something like um, The Art of Finding Career Joy you know, would be a good segue. And I think that kind of sums it up that I like to have a good time as, as probably your listeners can hear yeah. that <laughs> it's all holistic, right? <laughs> Let's face it, some of us are stuck working. Yeah, you always like to have a good time. I can say that. And, and you know, we have to be technical and learn all this stuff. <laughs> but you got to have fun with your colleagues and, and and not let the work become work that, you know, if you can find joy in what you're doing, then the day just goes so much faster and you feel like, all right, this mission I'm on, this is making a difference and I feel good about it. Right. Absolutely. So what would the summary of the book say about you? I think it would um, really talk about my journey, my, um, you know, unconventional path about how I've taken some years off to be an entrepreneur, to not let go of my passion, my initial passion of fine art, and to also keep um, my, my moral compass going the whole time. Always think about being a team player and being somebody who is the mailman <laughs> that other folks, you know, want to work with um, because it's just so much more rewarding when you feel like when you have that achievement, when you have that big sales win, when you meet that revenue target, when you meet that milestone, if you're say an R&D person and you get that product launched or whatever it is, that it's so much more fun when you worked on everything together and everybody feels great about that success, that you didn't take any shortcuts, you didn't do anything that that really you'd regret, but you feel proud of the team um, and the team effort. Sure. Well, that is awesome. So uh, if you want to stay in contact with Joy, I her, her link on LinkedIn is scrolling across the screen. Um, if you also uh, want to purchase some of her art, uh, the link is on the screen, but it's also in the comments. So all you have to do is click on the link in the comments and, um, you know, uh, go to her marketplace. And we encourage you to go and support Joy and, and um, uh, see if you can find something there. You know, the holidays are coming up and you may need that extra gift, right? Or you may decide to get something for yourself. So Joy, any closing comments? Oh, this was just so much fun. I'm glad that uh, we got to connect. We should, next time you're in Chicago, I hope uh, <laughs> we can get together for real. But I, I think that this is awesome that you and I are similar and that you're also committed to uh, giving back and, and, you know, helping others develop is that's, I think, a question you didn't ask me, but um, one of the, the most critical things probably to working your way up the uh, the corporate uh leadership ranks is to develop others. Yes. Because the higher up you go, you simply do not have time to do everything yourself. And you're going to have to trust people more and more uh, to be that mailman for you. Yeah. And so you want to make it your first priority to to expand that capability within your circle of trust so that you can, um, you know, 
listen more to to what's going on in the market and then make those those big calls but let all of the uh the pieces fall into play with that great team you're building sure you're absolutely right about that and um i will i've definitely enjoyed having you you're always <laughs> fun to be around that's why your name is joy right yeah, happy, happy happy joy, joy. You know, like it's demand generation <laughs> at the end of the day that's what we do <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, folks, hopefully you had a good time tonight. Definitely uh, go check out Joy's uh, Marketplace. Check her out on LinkedIn as well and connect with her. You're building your network. So, folks, tomorrow night at 530 Central Time, you know, we have Talk Leadership with Cedric. We will have Miss Kimberly Delafoss on. And Kimberly is the Assistant City Manager for Lake Charles, Louisiana. She's a very good friend of mine. Come in uh, here, Kimberly, tomorrow. Then um, right after that at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, go with me to the Empowered Living Network. Um, and, you know, every Tuesday night we have the Black Entrepreneurs uh, live show. So um, definitely uh, come on over to there and listen to the Black Entrepreneurs Institute live. And then come right back here at 7.30 Central Time for Talk with TK. And she's going to be talking to, uh, about mental performance, and her Mindset 180 Academy. Thursday, you know you can catch me on the radio, 2 p.m. Central Time on IBGR Network. And folks, I always want to remind you, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Don't be on the menu. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.